Good afternoon. We begin at police headquarters and a new auto theft awareness campaign. Crime Stoppers is offering enhanced rewards. CTV's Beth McDonnell has just come out of a Toronto police news conference and joins us now live with more details. Beth. Nathan, Michelle, this is a big issue for people across Toronto, and now Crime Stoppers is offering up money to help curb the number of auto thefts across the city. This new campaign that Crime Stoppers is launching means it's offering up to $5,000 for information to assist investigators in identifying the people responsible for stealing vehicles. So far this year, thefts are down almost 20%, still more than 5,300 vehicles have been stolen since the start of January. And carjackings in 2024 are up by 50% from 109 last year to 164 this year. In addition to raising awareness about auto theft, this campaign aims to deter would-be criminals by encouraging anonymous reporting of auto theft and other crimes to Crime Stoppers. Toronto Crime Stoppers processes over seven thousand tips and 15,000 follow-ups annually, which has assisted investigators in solving numerous cases in which community members were victimized. The value that Toronto Crime Stoppers brings to our service is immense. In 2023, anonymous tips helped solve five homicides, led to over 100 arrests, with over 700 charges laid. And so this campaign, this money, police and Crime Stoppers really hoping this is going to make a difference. But this money doesn't last forever. The campaign runs from today, August 20th, until September 30th. Reporting live outside Toronto Police Headquarters, I'm Beth McDonnell. Now back to Michelle and Nathan. All right, thank you, Beth. Still to come this half hour, a homeless man in Toronto who lives in his van shares his story about how difficult it is to find an affordable place to live. But first, let's take a look at the forecast. Here's a live shot of the city. A big change from yesterday. Lots of sunshine, but a little bit cooler. You may have needed a jacket this morning. However, temperatures are rising. Jessica Smith is back. Good to see you. You missed all that rain <laughs> and then that cool weather, but you're back with the sunshine. Well, I was in and I just wasn't here talking about it. But it was definitely a shift, right? We felt that humidity on the weekend, a bit of a cool down yesterday. And we're in that transitional time. We are still very much in the summer season. I have lots of people asking me, is summer over? Absolutely not. But we're starting to see that time of year where things change just a little and wind direction has a massive impact. But we're looking at high pressure really being the dominant system. And that means a ton of sunshine, a much more stable air mass sitting over us. Wind direction plays a really big role today. We're looking at wind sustained out of the north today, right around 30 kilometers an hour. But the gusts into the afternoon, a little closer to 50. So... There are two schools of thought when it comes to the forecast this time of year. You either really enjoy the cool down or you miss the heat. And we're having kind of that battleground as we head throughout the week when it comes to our temperatures. Right now, around southern Ontario, in the upper teens, it is not cold, but it is definitely a noticeable change. We're sitting in and around kind of that 15 to 16 degree range for the most part right across southern Ontario. And we are relatively dry. Some leftover showers through the east, but we're holding on to a decent amount of high pressure as we really sit throughout the majority of the week ahead. 17 degrees apiece. There's not really too much going on as far as active weather goes, but the wind is going to play a big role in how cool it feels throughout the day today. As we head into the afternoon, we do climb into the 20s, and the seasonal norm this time of year is around 25. So by no means are we feeling that super hot heat, but it is going to be a noticeable change throughout the day today. Heading throughout the week, though, it does get really nice. We're getting back to a much more seasonal point. And then as we head into the next five to seven days, we see that climb back towards and then just above seasonal. So if you like the cool down, enjoy today. If you like the heat, wait until the weekend. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including what we can expect if you're heading out to say the CNE this week or any of the other events around the city. But right now, I'll send things back over to Michelle and Nathan. Thanks, Jess. Canada's annual inflation rate cooled to a 40-month low in July. It was down to 2.5% last month from 2.7% in June. Prices for passenger vehicles, electricity and travel tours helped drive the figure lower.
the trend of lower inflation is very, very clear now. There's no question that uh, uh, price inflation in the Canadian economy is solidly on its way down. It's the seventh consecutive month that headline inflation, the pace of headline inflation, has declined in Canada. And if you uh, calculate a three-month moving average, which uh, uh, a lot of uh, economists consider a more reliable way of measuring the trend, uh, the, that three-month moving average is declining uh, as well. July's rate match forecasts and keeps the Bank of Canada on track to cut interest rates again. The central bank is scheduled to host its next interest rate announcement on September 4th. In the Middle East, Israel's recovered the bodies of six hostages taken in the October 7th Hamas attack that started the war in Gaza. The military says its forces recovered the bodies in an overnight operation in southern Gaza. It did not say when or how the hostages died. Hamas is still believed to be holding around 110 people captured in the attack. The recovery came as the United States, Egypt and Qatar are trying to mediate a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas that would see the release of the other hostages being held. In Gaza City, Palestinian officials say an Israeli airstrike on a school turned shelter killed at least 10 people. They say around 700 people were sheltering at the school when it was hit. Israel says Hamas militants had set up a command center inside the school and were planning and launching attacks. The search for six people missing after a super yacht capsized and sank continues off the coast of Sicily. Global Affairs Canada says it's aware of reports that a Canadian has died. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth has the details. A violent storm capsized and sank the luxury yacht Bayesian early Monday morning. The yacht's owner, British technology tycoon Mike Lynch, and his 18-year-old daughter Hannah are among the missing. Twelve passengers and ten crew members were on board when the yacht sank. Can we watch the ship behind us? Karsten Borner, captain of a ship anchored nearby, said he watched the yacht struggle to stay afloat as the storm intensified. And after the, the storm was over, we noticed that the ship behind us was gone. To underscore the fierce nature of this sudden and violent storm this morning, one local fisherman said he was watching this luxury yacht closely and said it sank and disappeared within seconds. Borner discovered a life raft with 15 survivors from the Bayesian, including Lynch's wife and a one-year-old baby. The baby's mother told an Italian newspaper she used all of her strength to save her child. Four people injured, three heavy injured. Yeah. And uh, we brought them to our ship. All 15 survivors were treated at a nearby hospital. Divers have reached the yacht's hull 160 feet below sea level as the search for the six missing passengers continues. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. Now a closer look at the destruction left behind by a wildfire in Jasper, Alberta. It comes after residents in Jasper started to return home. CTV's Kathy Lee has the story. A gallery of devastation, the air thick with the scent of charred memories. There is nothing else to do but take it all in. The east end of town looks like never happened, nothing happened there. Eh? You come over here, it looks like a war zone. It's hard to believe, it's like, more like a nightmare. It's a nightmare many won't wake up from. Some homes now in ruins. Basically a pile of ashes and uh, debris, you know. There's a few things I recognize, but most of it I don't know what it is. This man owned the L&W family restaurant. It too, gone. It's hard. It's a heartbreaking. You work 60 years and all of a sudden, in one night, you lose everything. A third of the town was destroyed by wildfire more than three weeks ago, most of the damage on the west side. The fire was indiscriminate. On one side of the street, houses untouched. On the other, complete destruction. It's crazy. It's kind of surreal. Like, it's a lot different than the photos once you see it in real life. The wildfire now being held. We're not expecting any future growth or any threat to the municipality at this time. Declared on the day Morgan Kitchen was remembered. The 24-year-old Calgarian died fighting the wildfire. His bravery not lost on Jasper. That's more painful. And there will be other moments of pain. 
on the long road to recovery. Many resolved to rebuild, others still uncertain. I kind of wonder, should I rebuild or should I take my money and go elsewhere? Only people in Jasper, business owners and professionals helping them are allowed in the town. RCMP members are patrolling the area to ensure non-Jasper residents stay away for now. Kathy Lee, CTV News, Jasper, Alberta. If they do pursue this, it will be absolutely devastating. Back here at home, there is concern today that 10 safe injection sites could be closed under a new plan to be announced by the Ford government. The South Riverdale Centre safe injection site is being hailed as one that has saved up to 1,000 lives. But there are concerns the Leslieville location could be among up to 10 forced to close due to new provincial policies to be announced this afternoon. City Hall reporter Natalie Johnson is following this story. And Natalie, the existence of safe injection sites is controversial. While they are touted as saving lives, others believe they are the wrong approach. What's going on? What's the latest here? Well, Michelle, harm reduction advocates insist that lives are at stake with this provincial plan, the details of which are set to be announced by the health minister later this afternoon. But what we know is that 10 supervised consumption sites across the province are slated to be closed under new rules that would see them banned within 200 metres of schools. The province is set to ban supervised consumption sites within 200 metres of schools, forcing the closure of 10 sites province-wide and five in Toronto. The official announcement expected this afternoon after the Premier hinted last week it would be coming. I'll be very frank, I'm not sold on these safe injection sites that are in neighbourhoods, that needles are all flown around. It's a haven for drug dealers, in my opinion. Let's get these people the support they need, build more detox beds. The change comes in the wake of two reviews of the sites ordered by the government following the death of Carolina hubner Makarat, The Leslieville woman was fatally struck by a stray bullet from a shooting near one of the sites last summer. It's very, very unclear why the Ford government is pursuing this move right now. Um, they haven't released the results of the review that you just mentioned. And most importantly, we're in the midst of a very, very dire public health crisis in Ontario. Ontario has the highest number of overdose deaths in Canada. This is devastating news. These are life-saving services for people. Community crisis worker Diana Chan McNally says the government's move prioritizes politics over policy. We closed down a number of these sites. We're going to see a death toll rising out on our streets. And for people who are concerned uh, about people using drugs, it will be much more visible out everywhere. And again, we will have extreme loss of life. We already have that. Um, so cutting off these resources, which again are life saving for people, will result in mass death. Harm reduction advocates arguing that it is logical to put the sites within community health centres to connect clients to broader health services. The government says it will introduce more addiction recovery supports and new treatment hubs. The chief of police was asked for his response to this plan today. He says he wants to see the details announced this afternoon and that his force will respond appropriately. The Board of Health chair also expected to respond to this announcement later this afternoon. We'll bring you all of that reaction tonight at 5 and 6 o'clock. Reporting live, I'm Natalie Johnson. Back to you, Nathan and Michelle. All right, thank you, Natalie. In Chicago, the Democratic National Convention will switch gears this evening. The focus will turn to the presidential campaign after Joe Biden's passing of the torch last night. I'm proud that I've kept my commitment to have an administration that looks like America and that taps in to the full talent of our nation. The most diverse cabinet in history, including the first black woman in South Asian descent to serve as vice president. And will soon serve as the 47th president of the United States. Harris made a brief appearance at the convention yesterday to thank Biden for his leadership. Today, she's traveling to Milwaukee for a rally in the swing state of Wisconsin before returning to Chicago late in the evening. Tonight, former President Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, and second gentleman Doug Emhoff will speak at the convention. It's hard to talk about day two at the Democratic National Convention without touching on the events of day one, namely U.S. President Joe Biden's farewell address essentially to the party that he has been representing for more than 50 years, first in the Senate, then as vice president, now as president. The crowd, the, the speech was really late. The crowd, however, didn't really seem to mind. Uh, there was a four-minute standing ovation for Biden. 
Uh, he made a number of references to Trump, also talked about some of what he would characterize as his administration's accomplishments. And really, actually, what I noticed, he went off script a number of times, invoking Kamala Harris, saying, we did that, me and Kamala. Often, every time he touted an accomplishment, there was a very concerted effort in order to kind of throw or pass the torch to Kamala Harris. She got up there after the speech alongside um, his family, and the crowd essentially went crazy. They're probably going to be pretty excited for some more of their political all-stars tonight, including Barack and Michelle Obama. They are expected to be the headliners this evening, expected also to talk a lot about Donald Trump and the ways in which they feel a, a second Trump presidency would be damaging to the country. That's also something we heard from former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. All in all, many big name speakers laying the groundwork so they can focus on Trump and sort of a more negative message around that and lay, allow Kamala Harris when she takes the stage Thursday to focus on more forward looking things. At least that's what strategists behind the scenes in the Democratic Party are telling us. Back to you. Thank you. And CTV Scott Hurst is following the convention. Scott, what were the highlights of day one in Chicago? Well, Nathan, first and foremost, you heard Vashi mention that uh, the scheduling last night went quite late. The keynote address went quite late. And because of that, we're hearing that some of the DNC organizers are shifting some of the programming earlier so that the keynote, the primetime addresses, don't go so late into the evening. But the highlight of the night was, of course, hearing from the current U.S. President Joe Biden. We also did hear briefly from Kamala Harris, and we also heard from Hillary Clinton. But last night really was about Joe Biden, a focus on his legacy and then the passing of the torch. And, of course, this wasn't a speech that Biden wanted to give. And up until a couple weeks ago, just over a month ago, it was a speech that he wasn't planning to give. He was planning to be on the final night to formally accept the nomination. But then there was that disastrous debate performance. And then a lot of time where Democrats really seemed to be in turmoil, trying to decide who they want on the top of their ticket until Biden decided to step out of the race, potentially forced out of the race, and Kamala Harris then took the helm and took the lead as the presumptive nominee. So even though it was a speech that he wasn't planning for, Biden continued to make the case that Donald Trump is still a threat to democracy and must de uh, be defeated. And he said he's hopeful that Harris could finish the job. So this is a big week for Democrats, not just to uh, pitch their plan to the American voters, to the American people, but also really, you could say, introduce their new candidate. I know it seems a bit strange to say that as Kamala Harris has been on the national stage for several years as the vice president of Joe Biden, but this is a new platform for her. This is a new stage. So really try to, uh, uh, try to introduce her to this role to the American people. And so that is what a lot of the programming will continue to be throughout the rest of the week, Nathan. Yeah, and with that, what is on the agenda for today? Mm -hmm. We mentioned that if, if the first night was all about passing the torch, it's now back to Kamala Harris and back to the current campaign. You said that uh, some of the keynote speakers will be the Obamas, former President Barack Obama and his wife, Michelle. We'll also hear from Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff. So the passing of the torch happened last night. That was a speech from Joe Biden. Now Joe and his wife, Jill Biden, will kind of be out of sight. They'll move on off to the stage to allow the spotlight to be solely on Kamala Harris. The two of them are not even heading back to Washington, D.C. The U.S. president and his wife will be keeping a low profile in Santa Barbara County, the central coast of California, to stay out of the spotlight, stay out of the limelight, to allow Kamala Harris to really soak it all in and allow all the attention to be on the presumptive nominee before she officially accepts the nomination on Thursday night, Nathan. Right. Any reaction from the Republicans? Well, the big uh, message for the Republicans is to have some counter-programming. Of course, as you remember, during the Republican National Convention just a few weeks ago, it's incredibly hard for the other party to get their message out there because these conventions really consume all the headlines, really consume all the oxygen on news stations, newspapers, and any other platforms that follow it. And so what the Trump campaign is doing is setting up a very busy week, one of the busiest weeks for Donald Trump on the campaign trail for many months, and he'll be taking his message to several battleground states. He was in Pennsylvania yesterday. He's expected in Michigan later today. 
and he'll also be taking his message to the U.S.-Mexico border, the southern border, later this week in Arizona. Of course, the Republicans have been branding uh, Biden and Harris as weak on the border, weak on illegal border crossings, and so that is a key message for Republicans. So Donald Trump will be in several battleground states and also the U.S.-Mexico border later this week to try to get some attention. You know, you could do often called counter-programming during the Democratic National Convention, Nathan. All right, CTV's Scott Hurst, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Quarterback Chad Kelly is back with the Argos after a suspension stemming from a lawsuit by a conditioning coach alleging sexual harassment. The CFL says Kelly was reinstated in what's called a last chance agreement. CTV Sean Lee Thong is at the Argos practice today and joins us now live with more. Sean. Nathan, Michelle, Chad Kelly was found to have violated the league's gender-based violence policy last May. The suspension that followed was two exhibition games and nine regular season games, a significant suspension. But the agreements with which he was reinstated uh, remains rather unknown. The terms of the agreement will not be said. We know that the uh, accusations from the former strength and conditioning coach were settled uh, through mediation, but the focus now shifts to Chad Kelly's appearance on the field here at Lamport Stadium. Now, he was taking many of the snaps this morning with what looked like the main offense and uh, could potentially start this Thursday when the Argonauts take on Saskatchewan. But it's just unclear just how much he will be able to play because, as we know, he's missed the first nine games of the season. To give you just uh, a contrast of what Chad Kelly means to this team, last year the Argonauts went 16-2 and when he was the most outstanding player for the CFL. This year the team is 5-4, and four, so they would be looking to get him back in the lineup. But then there is the question of his reinstatement itself. Now, you mentioned there was a last chance agreement. That is the focus on just how he will behave once he is back on the field, what will happen, and it's really up in the air. We're expecting at about 12.45 when practice ends to hear from players, coaches, Coach Ryan Dinwiddie to talk about whether he will be starting on Thursday, and we're hoping to hear from Chad Kelly himself because throughout this process there has been uh, a, a lot of silence. Now, Kelly did come out with a statement saying he was taking accountability for his actions, taking responsibility for his actions, but we'll see what happens when the pressure is back on and when he is back in that team environment. I can tell you from what I saw on the field today, the players were welcoming him with open arms. There was a lot of positivity as they were trying to uh, keep things positive, in fact, and feel good as they go into their game because they have a lot of work to do before their next game in just two days' time. So we'll be here on the field. We'll have more coming up at 5 and 6 o'clock tonight. But for now, Nathan and Michelle, I'll have to throw it back to you inside. All right. Thank you, Sean. An Ottawa court is expected to hear final arguments from the legal teams of two Freedom Convoy organizers today. Tamara Leach and Chris Barber are charged with mischief, intimidation and counseling others to break the law. The trial has been legally complicated and marked with dozens of starts and stops since it began last September. Court is expected to hear from Barber's counsel before Leach's lawyers deliver their final submissions. The Crown previously told the court the two knowingly crossed the line between legal protest and illegal mischief-making. A glimpse now into what life is like when you don't have a roof over your head. And the impact of the lack of affordable housing on one man who's forced to live in his van. CTV's John Musselman has the story. I can stretch right out and I have no problem. I got my blanket. My blanket is here. Kevin Lasky is 67 years old. Right now, this is my home. And he lives in his 2015 Dodge Caravan. Uh, during the day, I usually end up at Yorkdale or Vaughan Mills, walking around, sitting in the food court, walking around. That's where I spend my days. And then when they close them all at 10 o'clock, I end up in my van, either in their parking lot or another parking lot or at one of the parks. Lasky's issue began last February when his landlord got ill and sold the condo where he was living. He hasn't been able to find anything since that he can afford. He tried shelters at first, but he didn't feel safe. And he's on a waiting list for community housing. Lasky shared his story recently on News Talk 1010. He says there are more people like him out there. I, I think they need to hear uh, that we, we do need more housing. And it's not that there's no housing available. There's lots of places available. It's the being able to afford to get them. Lasky says he brings in about $2,000 a month with old age security and CPP. He still has payments on the van plus insurance. He has an old cell phone that costs $61 a month. Then there's fuel and food. Lasky says there's not enough left over to cover rent. 
I'm going to do it for as long as I can. You know, I'm going to try try to get a place before the winter comes because it's going to be tough once winter comes. But Lasky has a sister in North Bay, but she can't take him in. So for now, the van remains his home. But this story may have a happy ending. Shalom Village in Hamilton says it wants to help. It offers services and supports for seniors in the Hamilton area. Well, our team will definitely um, provide a listening ear and see what it is that we can support. Um, this is quite a challenge for a lot of individuals in our society currently, and we want to just be able to provide a soft landing and in, in a place where people feel welcome and, and at home. And if there's anything that we can do to direct Kevin to some services to be able to support his needs, that's what we want to do to support him. The team at Shalom Village has already reached out to Lasky. We hope to have an update in the days ahead. John Musselman, CTV News. Despite having a bit of a cooler day, we still have a pretty high UV index. So sun protection and thinking about hydration still really important as we kind of get into this slightly transitional time of year. But if you're heading out this afternoon, maybe checking out to the c &E or just spending time outside, a nice forecast. But again, a light layer may be a good idea because we have that northwesterly wind with gusts between 40 and 50 kilometers an hour throughout the afternoon. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast and break down when we see more seasonal weather return. All those details coming up after the break. Did you have a chance to see the blue supermoon this morning? This was the view just as it was disappearing below the horizon just before sunrise. A beautiful clear morning to take in what is really somewhat a rare lunar sight. Amazing. Another rare sight. Jessica Smith. Hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, it was beautiful. I didn't see it. I was absolutely asleep. But it is getting into that time of year. We're seeing kind of the the transition start to take place. We're still very much in the summer season, but that layer in the morning, if you're an early riser, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, summer's not over. Nobody panic. But it is noticeably fresher in the mornings, especially today. And we have a northwesterly wind with gusts upwards of 50 kilometers an hour. So, I mean, it's not sweater weather just yet, but I mm -hmm. definitely needed a layer early on. The good news is as we step in towards the rest of our day, it does warm up slightly. We do kind of hover near seasonal, but we are going to return to where we should be pretty soon. Weather is brought to you by the Presler Law Firm. Injury lawyers, you don't pay unless they win. And again, if you were up early, maybe taking in a bit of a break at the beach, getting in for a walk, it was beautiful. But again, a little fresh, a light jacket, light sweater early on. If you're out walking the dog, getting your steps in, probably a good idea. The good news is as we step in towards the rest of our day today, we will kind of get back to where we should be. But we're still holding on to a decent amount of heat right now. It's warmer in Red Lake than it is here in the city of Toronto. We're sitting at 18 and those winds are a little breezy out of the northwest. Temperature wise, we're not wildly below seasonal, but you notice such a difference this time of year. We're sitting at about 21 as we head into the afternoon. We should be at 25 and almost everybody hovering just a little shy by four or five degrees of that seasonal norm. Heading into this evening, we're not too bad, but there are some single digits starting to creep back into the forecast. We're not in frost warning criteria, but we're holding on to temperatures in the single digits through Waterloo, through Godridge, Owen Sound, Perry Sound, Peterborough, Bancroft. It's a little cool as we get through this evening. Any leftover active weather really pushes its way through eastern Ontario. That last little bit of a trough there will push its way out as we head throughout the day. And for us here in the GTA, southern Ontario, northern Ontario, Eastern Ontario, Western Ontario, everybody uh, holding on to high pressure. It's going to be a really beautiful, albeit a little bit cooler day. Not much going on in the way of forecast and radar. Some spotty showers east of us and into that southwestern corner, but overall a decent amount of sunshine from start to finish. As we head into the day tomorrow, really more of the same. We're settling into a stretch of dry days. And after the downpour that we had over the weekend, we're holding on to a much drier forecast so that water has a chance to kind of dry up and, and really kind of soak into the ground. As we head in towards our Wednesday evening, more of the same. A great forecast, really, as we get ready to wrap up the month of August as we head in towards the next couple of weeks. Temperature-wise, again, it is shy of seasonal. We should be around 25. We're not wildly below, but you notice such a difference, especially when the winds are out of the north or northwest. It is a little cooler. We start to rebound towards seasonal as we head in towards the middle and end of the week with those overnight lows in that range where it's comfortable for sleeping. And it's really not until we get in towards the end of the week, stepping into the weekend where we get back to seasonal and just above. So 
If you are not feeling it this weekend with the rain, we have a beautiful forecast ahead for the weekend ahead of us. We're looking at temperatures coming back towards seasonal and then above and just a whole lot of sunshine. Thanks to that high pressure. Nathan, I'll send it back over to you. All right, good to hear. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. It is the worst case scenario when making an online payment, adding an extra zero or two when transferring money. It happened to one woman big time. CTV's Pat Foran has her story. Three types of European butcher back bacon have been recalled due to listeria concerns. The European butcher brand back bacon being recalled came whole in chunks and in slices. It has a batch code of 177 and the UPC codes listed on this page. Health Canada says not to consume, use, sell, serve or distribute the recalled products. Food contaminated with listeria may not look or smell spoiled, but can still make people sick. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh says the recall should be taken seriously. This is a nasty bacteria that can cause very severe disease in pregnant women, in the oldest Canadians and the youngest Canadians and in people who have an immunocompromised state. If you're not in that group, you still feel pretty sick with it. It mostly causes a gastrointestinal syndrome like diarrhea that self-resolves the vast majority of the time. But if you're in one of those at-risk groups, it can cause a, a bloodstream infection, sepsis, and uh, has a predilection to cause meningitis. And a reminder from Dr. Bogosh, there's no smell or taste that would give away listeria contamination. Many of us pay our bills using online banking. It's simple and fast, and usually there are no problems. But you have to be careful you put in the correct amount, because if you make a mistake, sometimes it can be really difficult to correct. CTV's Pat Foran has this story. Right away, it had gone in an instant. 89-year-old Ann Bank of Etobicoke pays her bills online and usually doesn't have any issues, but she recently made a mistake and paid a lot more than she planned to. I did the same as I always do, entered it in, except this time I neglected to put the period in. And Bank banks with TD Bank, but she also has a Visa card with RBC. In May, she was trying to pay her Visa bill of $131.07, but she forgot the decimal point and accidentally paid more than $13,000. The family was originally told not to worry and that the issue would be resolved within 15 days. But Anne's son Michael says it's now been three months and neither TD or RBC can tell them where the money is. We assumed that this was going to just settle itself. You just really cannot get a straight answer and that the money is just gone. It's in the netherworld, right? The banks say every time they inquire about the overpayment, it's like starting over, and Anne is growing concerned her money might be gone for good. Somewhere out there is my money, but I really would like to have that money back. I can use it. When CTV News reached out to RBC, a spokesperson said it followed an established process to complete the refund and that while this matter has now been resolved, we understand it took longer than expected to reach a resolution. So Anne finally got a check for the overpayment she made to her account. She says she'll be more careful paying bills in the future and was grateful to get her money back. I am certainly very relieved. It's been a re really stressful summer for me. Thank you so much, CTV. Pat Foran, CTV News. Speaking of money and it disappearing quickly, have you started your back-to-school shopping? Are clothes and shoes at the top of your list or perhaps school supplies? Well, it's time to take note. We've got some tips on how to stretch the back to school dollar. We're joined now live by Kathleen Cassidy, who describes herself as an extreme coupon clipper and is known for the living on a loony blog. Great to have you with us, Kathleen. I've certainly seen firsthand with my trio at home, if you are not careful, the back to school shopping bill can get out of control fast. First, before we get to maybe some specific tips, what's your overall approach to back to school shopping? For sure. I think things can really add up quickly now, as we all know. But one of the best tips is to kind of do an inventory of what you have. I feel like the step is often missed. So what do you have from last year and what can we reuse that, you know, something's still good. We can reuse a backpack or a lunch bag or something like that. We don't have to completely go out and buy everything new. Yes, although 
I, I just said that to my kids. You don't need new backpacks. They look amazing. And they said, but we want new stuff. So that's a conversation <laughs> to have. But let's talk to you. Let's just say you need some new things. When it comes to school supplies and clothes, what are your tips there? Yeah, so the first thing is something that I use even for my weekly groceries, uh, using the Flip app. So this is a free app that you can download. And basically what it helps you do is compare pricing. So you can search for a backpack or a certain school supply and it will pull up all of the grocery store flyers in your local area and it will compare those prices for you. So you can make sure that if you are buying new, you can get the best price there. Um, and something else for clothing or even with school supplies now, we're starting to see a lot of seasonal clearance. So when you're looking in your stores, make sure you're kind of looking for those clearance sections. What items are they kind of getting rid of that may have a lower price? I know a lot of uh, stores are actually getting rid of school supplies now. So if you haven't shopped, it might be a good time to go check it out now. Getting rid of school supplies already. Because you pay such close attention to the prices of things, do you notice big wild differences in the price of things at different stores? Uh, for sure, there definitely is during different flyer period weeks. Um, again, I use the Flip app very closely, and again, I analyze the prices basically every week to share them with Canadians. So you'll definitely see some differences, and that's also how I know, you know, when I go into a store right now, okay, they're clearing out those school supplies, and they're starting to bring those other seasonal holiday items coming in. Um, so it's really, if you can kind of wait a week or two, I know we're getting close to back to school, but you're really going to get the best deal starting now. That's good to know. Tech. That can be a big ticket item, especially for yes. older kids, people in high school. Any advice there? Yeah, so again, the Flip app will actually compare even stores, you know, like Best Buy, if we're looking at Walmart. Um, so you can actually compare even those bigger ticket items as well. So just by searching, if you want a specific model of computer or something like that, it will show you the different prices. Um, a lot of those stores as well for tech items will price match. So, you know, maybe you don't have um, one store closer than another, but you can go and they will actually match that price of the local competitor. So you can do that as well. Um, and also, again, do we need need an item that is completely new or can we look at a program such as refurbished or items such as open box items a lot of the time open box items are cheaper but they were never actually used or even turned on by a lot of people they just decided they didn't like them or opened the box in store and realized the model wasn't for them mm, that is such some great advice uh, also another big ticket item that doesn't go away even when school is underway and that's just the cost of food right for all the lunches you have to pack and then you know i know in elementary school it's two snacks a day you're packing any advice there Again, the biggest thing is always comparing prices, especially when it comes to groceries or snacks, looking at where you're doing your grocery shopping. So again, the Flip app is great for comparing prices, but then what store you're choosing? Do they have a loyalty points program? What is their weekly flyer looking like that week? And can you buy in bulk? Um, sometimes it is cheaper to buy in bulk, sometimes it's not. So just quickly doing a little bit of math and kind of pre-planning what you're gonna have for snacks or lunches that week can really help you save in the long run. Mm -hmm. Do you set a budget, like a set and stone kind of budget and then just buy within that? Is that the best way to go about it? So normally I do have a set budget, yes, um, but I would say to even stay on budget is making sure, again, even when it comes to food, what do you have in the pantry, fridge, freezer, what can we kind of use up before it goes to waste? Um, and then my biggest thing is kind of making that meal plan for the week. So looking at the grocery store flyers, what is on sale this week that we can pick up and kind of how can we make sure that we're stretching our dollar with the items that are on sale um, and making sure that we get all the meals that we need as well. Mm, some great advice uh, to consider. Kathleen Cassidy with Living on a Looney. Really appreciate it. I think you saved us all some money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Still to come, some good news on the inflation front, especially if you're up for a mortgage renewal or will need a loan later this year. Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. The prospect of a strike or lockout involving railway workers is causing a lot of concern. Barring any last-minute agreements, the vast majority of all goods transported by rail would grind to a halt on Thursday. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports. On an average day, more than $1 billion worth of goods are carried on Canada's railways. But with the likelihood of a strike growing, more shipments are being cut back, bringing pain to businesses. There's no really any plan B. Uh, available for uh, businesses. It's not like suddenly they can 
call up a trucking company. Shipments requiring refrigeration, including meats and some medicines, have already been halted by CN and CP Rail, as have shipments of hazardous materials. The world's largest overseas cargo carrier, Mersic, is no longer accepting large shipments destined for Canadian railways. This is a serious and urgent uh, uh, concern for us. There's nothing more important than uh, an, an economy that's potentially about to shut down. CN says negotiations are ongoing and blames the Teamsters Union for dragging out the process. Until this weekend, the Teamsters have not put forward any counter offers on any points whatsoever. We received one offer from them over the weekend, but we still remain too far apart. The union, however, is accusing the railways of offering proposals that would make working conditions worse. Both CN and CPKC are trying to erode protections in our collective agreement around scheduling, around fatigue, around rest. With the two sides seemingly far apart, industry associations are calling for the federal labour minister to prevent a strike by either introducing back-to-work legislation or forcing the parties into binding arbitration. We cannot accept perishable good to go to waste for uh, this kind of negotiation. In a statement issued, the federal labour minister called on all parties to do the work necessary at the bargaining table to avoid a work stoppage. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News. Economists think another interest rate cut is coming soon as Canadian inflation continues to slow. Andrew Bell of BM Bloomberg has the latest in business. Hello there, here are your business headlines. Inflation in Canada has decelerated to the slowest pace in more than three years. And that is seen as keeping the Bank of Canada on track to cut rates for a third straight meeting next month. The consumer price index rose 2.5% in the year to July, slowing from a 2.7% pace a month earlier. And the data may well give the central bank a clear runway to cut rates another quarter percentage point on September 4th. Canadian shares slipped from yesterday's record high in morning trading, but gold miners climbed again as bullion hit a new record above $2,527 US an ounce. Meanwhile, CIBC says that with interest rates falling, investors are set to plow more than $200 billion into Toronto's out-of-favour dividend-paying stocks, whose payouts are becoming more alluring. Sectors set to gain include utilities, real estate and telecom. And finally, the Financial Times of London says a federal agency, Export Development Canada, has been hit with losses after lending the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars to Britain's crisis-hit Thames Water. Papers said Ottawa-based EDC originally lent to the utility in 2018 to, quote, support an investment by the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System. Omers has written down the value of its stake in Thames Water to zero. The agency has said it lent the cash to provide, quote, for support for Canadian direct investment abroad. BNN Bloomberg has contacted EDC for comment. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. Another downtown construction project is adding to Toronto's traffic troubles. A major intersection is closed this week and is causing the detours, delays and discontent for many drivers. CTV's Mike Walker has the story. Excavation has started, prompting another major road closure in the core. The city reconstructing the St. George and Bloor intersection, work it says will improve safety for all road users like Adam Ahmed who rides his bike to and from work every day. I think it's great. I think it uh, makes me feel a lot safer. Uh, I feel a lot more comfortable biking and just in traffic. He welcomes the improvements for cyclists that include corner islands to separate and protect cyclists from vehicles, as well as a permanent race cycle track. Generally speaking, blockages uh, in the bike lanes. This is a way of preventing people or making it safe for us, essentially. Other improvements include dedicated bike signals, wider crosswalks, and designated right turn lanes for vehicles. Improvements that the city says will enhance safety and accessibility. A 300 meter stretch of Bloor is off limits to vehicles between Huron and Bedford. And while the closure is only expected to last a week, the city is warning drivers to brace for delays as traffic detours on other nearby streets. I hate it. <laughs> it's not that great. Every time you're trying to go to an appointment or go to work, it's always a bit of a nuisance. I'm sure it's going to be inconvenient, 
This is the final phase of a major project along Blue or West stretching between Avenue and Spadina. But for some business owners, another road closure is too much to bear. It's been continuous for two years. First, Bloor Street is closed east, then it's closed west. Joe Macario owns a restaurant and cafe. Both are located within the road closure. Customers don't know where to come and how to come, and why would you want to come? And so the question is, can it be done faster? Do we really need all of this real estate given to cyclists? Drivers now trying to plan detours. I feel like I'm living in a maze of construction in every corner of downtown. And some see the silver lining. I'm really happy that they're trying to improve. You know, we've had a number of cases with cyclists being hit by uh, verticals. Mike Walker, CTV News. Let's get you caught up on the weather forecast. Definitely, it feels fresh, but that mm -hmm. freshness with the sunshine, for a lot of people, is really nice. It's that perfect balance, right? You can be outside, you don't need a ton of layers, but you're not absolutely sweating when you first walk out the door. So we're not completely switching gears just yet into fall weather entirely, but it is a noticeably fresher start. As we head throughout the week, though, it's that slow but steady climb. I think I can, I think I can, back towards more seasonal weather. For now, though, we're holding on to a relatively clear sky. I feel like clouds out there and some showers through eastern Ontario, but for the most part, a beautiful day. Still sitting at just 18 uh, here in the city, but that's kind of the range between 16 and about 19 degrees. We will get up to about 21 as we head into the afternoon, and then it's a steady climb back towards seasonal, and that's just a whole lot of sunshine in the forecast for the next seven days. All right, thank you, Jess. And that is CTV News at noon. Remember, you can get Toronto's breaking news all day long on CP24 and at our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and the whole team here, have a pleasant afternoon. I'm Michelle Dubay. And I'm Nathan Downer. Be sure to join us later for CTV News at 5 and 6. Have a great day.